Today we discussed in class a concept. I, I figured out I was tall the other day. Huh? See? I figure out crazy things when you're just, you know, here alone. Like, you, my mind just wonders. I'm a little special. I figured out I was tall. Watch this, okay? Watch this. Boom. See? Did y'all get it? Look how tall I am. I'm like this much taller than this yardstick. So that makes me tall. Usually I use one of those, like, stretch rulers, you know, where I can, you know, ding, see how far it is, and I'm like, I'm really short. But with this, I'm huge. The point being, it's all what we compare it to. If I compare myself to this, I'm pretty tall. Oh, they gave me a magic click if you didn't notice. I'll have to just pick up my hand. It's magic. It's awesome. But Romans 15, I was trying to figure out how to discuss God's love. And, and I looked to Christ, and Christ gave it in such a weird way. He said, he was forgiven much, loves much. He is forgiven little, loves little. And it was all about that comparison. Because when we look to God, we're going to find something. In Romans 15, we're going to see how God tells us to love the parasite. I, I used this phrase and somebody got upset because I was calling people parasites. You were all parasites at one time. You lived off your mother's blood. You stole their nutrients. You stole their energy. You stole everything you can, and you left them miserable. Uh, isn't it great? So before somebody gets upset and says, I just called people parasites, I did. I did. I agree with you. But in Romans chapter 15, we're going to see a phrase weakness, and I want you to realize that means no strength. And I want you to see who it's compared to. And it tells us we should love, and it compares us to the love that Christ has. He doesn't go, oh, let me look to a meter stick and think I'm tall. He doesn't say, look to a you know, really small measure of love and go, I'm very loving. But he tells us this instead. Starting in verse 1, Romans chapter 15. Now we who are strong ought to bear with the weakness of those without strength. And not just please ourselves. Each of us is to please his neighbor for his good, to his edification. For Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. So that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Reproaches. Reproaches is one of those words that I don't like how they make words in the Bible really hard to understand. Insult. Can you imagine that God came and we, he read that scripture? He read Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, and it didn't just say, He came, He took away our sins, hallelujah. He says, He came, He took away our iniquities, our sufferings, our pain, our sorrow. It was a list. He took away a lot because He bore it all. We look to the passion of the Christ and we're going to find something. He was insulted. And that seems eh, trivial, right? I mean, the fact that he dies, the fact that he's tortured, the fact that he's spit upon, the fact that all these other bad things happen, he was insulted too. They made sure to include it. Because Christ does more than just take away sins. He came to take away the whole picture. The suffering. The agony, all those things that came with the fall, he comes to take away. And in this, we're told that now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength and not just please ourselves. And then it tells us why. The reproaches of those who reproach you fell on me. Can, can you imagine that every time you're insulted that Christ takes that? That little thing that is not near as big as all the persecutions in history, but it's that little thing where you're insulted. And Christ takes that because it mattered to him. 
And when we look at the church, we're given a hard challenge right here. It says, when we are strong, we ought to bear with the weakness of others. I titled this, Love the Parasite. A parasite is a relationship where you get something and the other one doesn't. There's no benefit to the giver. And too often we look at things and we say, well, if we gave to this, where would we get back? But this isn't the phrasing here. It says, you are strong, they are weak, they are without strength. Literally, it translates to, they have no strength. The only thing I can think of that has no strength was a baby. So that's the term we went with. That parasite. Think about it. It depends on you for everything. And, and it's not like the mother benefits. How many have heard of me at morning sickness? Oh, really fun, huh? Okay. How many of you have ever realized that is taking from their oxygen? So they get winded quicker. Oh. Taking from their new nutrients. So they got to make sure they're getting extra nutrients. It's taking everything because, as it describes weakness here, it means without strength. And the picture is that Christ was strong enough to help us. And we were so unable to do anything that we can now turn around and serve as Christ and not just please ourselves. Starting in verse 5. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. So that with one accord, you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us, to the glory of God. For I say that Christ has become a servant to circumstance on behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and for the Gentiles, to glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles. And I will sing to your name. And again, he says, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And let all the people praise him. Again, Isaiah says, there shall come the root of Jesse. And he who arises to rule of the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles hope. This one accord, this one hope, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. This oneness of spirit begins with this. A beautiful comparison of helping a parasite. It begins with a comparison in which we can't be one until I care enough about insults. That's pretty petty, isn't it? An insult. But yet if my brother or sister has suffered an insult, Christ dies and suffers insults so that you don't have to. And when we look at someone and we view them as... Having suffered something, we don't go, is that petty? We ask instead, is it big to them? We like the phrases, you know, be tough, tough it out, overcome, da 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 da, da. And yet the scripture tells us to weep with those who weep. That doesn't actually sound like I'm saying overcome it. It says, let me join with you. Let me join with you. You're suffering. Let me join with you. Let me suffer with you. Let you be parasitic to me. Because he has given us hope. He has given us a oneness. And the only way to achieve that is one through his power. And two, to focus on him. Because if we leave any other standard on the table and we say, well, I'm pretty good in comparison to this or I'm pretty good in comparison to that, God is pointless to you. One of the things I, I love to tell people, if you're not a sinner, you don't need God. Because you have these people who have this concept of church that church is all these things they've made it to be, all these things they've created it to be. And you know what God has said? He didn't come to call the righteous. He came to call sinners. He came with a completely different idea of what everything should be. 
he upset the system. And he said, love. He said, care for those. He said, it's about hope. He said, it's no longer about you getting your way. How many of us have thought about it? We went to church and we're like, well, it would have been better. I would have got more if. And how many of us have ever asked the opposite question? What would have helped them more? What if you came to church and instead of going, I wonder what would be best for me, I said, well, these ones are new in the faith. I always look to youth, and I know that's probably just because I've been a youth minister so long. But I look to them and I say, which one is the weak and which one should be the strong? The adults, right? The adults should be the strong ones who set the example, and the weak ones should be the youth. The little ones trying to learn about God. And we come to church and we ask this question, would I get more out of it? But how many of us come to church and say, okay, what would the youth get more out of? They're the weaker ones. How could I make them into God? How could I make them so on fire for Jesus that I can't stop them? And that would change everything we ask in church. And we would be talking about the oneness. We'd be coming together right now and saying, one another, according to Christ Jesus. So one accord, made with one voice, glorify God. That would change things a lot if we asked the right questions. Verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And concerning you, my brethren, I myself am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to admonish one another. But I've written very boldly to you on some points, so as to remind you again, because of the grace that was given me from, the gospel, from God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in Christ Jesus, I have found reason for boasting in things pertaining to God, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem and round about as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And thus I aspired to preach the gospel, not where Christ was already named, so I'd not build on another man's foundation. But as is written, they who had no news of him shall see, and they who have not heard shall understand. For this reason, I have often been preventing from coming to you. On this one, he says it again in a slightly different way. He says he's going to go where they haven't heard. We talked about the weak. We talked about Gentiles. And to them, that was the outcast. He then talks about going to those who have not heard. But what does he really want? He says it. I mean, you'll see in Paul's writings that he says he wants to come to them. He's like, I hate sending you a letter. I wish I could just come to you and talk to you about it. But he says, I can't. He says, I can't come to you because there are people who have not heard. This is kind of hard when we look at this and we go, we ask ourselves, who are the weak? Who are the outcasts? Who are those who have not heard? And it comes back to that measuring stick. We, we don't have Christ going to the Pharisees and going, let me teach you about God. I know you agree with me already about God. He goes out and he grabs those on the outcast and he keeps reaching out and he keeps going out. Meeting those who are not the same as us. Who are lost, who actually understand that they're sinful. And we take the measuring stick and we say, Christ is our measuring stick. And it quits being about us. It quits being church as usual. It quits being 
I want to do this, so I'm going to do it. What I mean, did you realize this last phrase is, for this reason, I have often been prevented from coming to you. Because he knew that he actually wanted to do what was right. He actually wanted to do the right things and go preach the gospel where it hadn't been heard. But that wasn't his desire. His desire was to go be with those who were like-minded. He wanted to go to those who had received the gospel and be with them and be encouraged and build each other up and have this sense of agape love and this building one another, edifying all the things we're called to do. He wanted that. But instead, he went somewhere else. He went where the gospel had not been. He looked for people who were lost so that he could change those who were lost. brings us back to one of the most often quoted verses ever. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life. And if that's our measuring stick, is God in heaven sending his son? Is God in heaven saying, take my only son. Let him suffer for you. Let him receive those insults for you. Let him receive that sickness for you. Let him receive that death for you. If that's the image we have of God, and in our strivings to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. How much less is it for me to say, I'll go? How much less is it for me to say, I'm not going to send my son? How much less is it to say, okay, I'm going to go to these lost. I'm going to go to these hurting. I'm going to be concerned about pleasing other people. And I'm asking myself real hard questions. Do I care more about what I get and am I pleased? Or do I care more about the weak ones? The young babes in Christ coming to God. But in this, he also ends with this beautiful option. That whosoever believes him should not perish, but should have eternal life. For when we believe in him is the only time he is granted the spirit. For when we believe in him, it's the only time we're going to obey him. And they're so closely linked that it's not even necessary to repeat it every time. If you believe in him, you will do what he calls you to do. Having heard the word of Christ, having believed that Jesus is the Christ, Having confessed Jesus as Lord, repenting of our sins, he offers us a baptismal cleansing and a life that we live for him. If anybody has not received that, or if anybody needs prayers, or if anybody wants to submit the eldership here, we ask you to come now as we stand and as we sing.